Hey, everybody. Welcome to Market Mavericks. We got the Top Gun crew here today. Uh, how are you doing, Scott and Mike? How are you guys doing? I'm good. I just hope I'm not Goose. <laughs> no. <Good>. Hello. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get right into it. We, we try to keep these shows uh, snappy and right to the point. So, so Mike, why don't you give us a rundown of what um, what we heard yesterday from Jerome Powell with the Federal Reserve? Uh, cool. So hey, can I, um, I'll, I'll start there. I'll just show a few charts if I can yep. share screen. And this is the key thing I've been focusing on a while. This is Fed funds, um, futures. There's still that's bar here. It's so that we're still expecting them to hike rates. Um, they didn't hike in November, but either in the Jan December or the January meeting. So that's still priced in that they might hike rates. I mean, the market hasn't gone enough downward enough to do that. So one thing he did is signal glo um, globally across the board. Everybody seems to get it that he's probably done tightening for good reason. And that's why I pulled up this 10 year chart. Um, it looks like 10 year yields have peaked at 5%. And I pull up here, I have a 40 year chart for a good reason because I put it in log normal to show you how fast rates have gone up. And typically what happens when you go into recessions, rates plunge. So I think we've peaked in rates. I said that a 4% full admission, I've been wrong. Um, I have to admit that. I think when we do the head into this recession, we're gonna drop hard to three, maybe 2%. I can dig into a lot more stuff, but I wanna just pivot over there. I have a bunch of charts I wanna show you, but let's just pivot over to where we want to conversation. And, and yeah, I just actually had a question for you. So, yeah. so you were just saying that the market still anticipates potentially another rate hike, but then why is the market, why has the market jumped so much in just the last few days, especially from yesterday's comments. Well, there you go. I, um, it's tis the season. Um, I was at um, the Money Show conference last week, and everybody said the same thing. It's seasonal. It's the time to buy. We've had a dip. Everybody was so bullish. And we all know what happens in bear markets. You get the sharpest rallies. So we had initially, this is S&P 500 versus its 200 day. We've been talking about this one for a while. First, we had the kiss and the rally and then the plunge below it. Now I think it's hugging. But the thing, Hing, the fact is still there. If you look at Fed funds and futures in one year, which is what this bottom line is, <laughs> there's still no hope of the Fed there to help you. So I think this right now, this bounce is a bear market rally. I think this part here was one of the biggest bear market rallies in history. And I'll show you one key reason, and I'll show you 10 other reasons why I think this recession call from our economic team is gonna be right, and that's right here. Container board demand is collapsing. You've heard of, I mean, when I was a treasury trader in the pits in the 80s, we watched this closely, just cardboard boxes. This is a measure of container board, cardboard box demand in this country. It's dropping at the same pace wow. as during the great financial crisis. Now, I have a bunch of dozen, I have a bunch of other ones. Now, I overlay this one with uh, crude oil because Scott likes, I'm sorry, Scott likes to remind how sometimes I've been quite bearish in crude oil. I have good reasons for that, but this is collapsing demand for the basics of our economy. And one thing I like to point out is the world's a lot different than here when you couldn't really push a button and have things order on your, come, come to your door and a phone and a cardboard box. And what's significant is the level is below where it was before COVID. This is an indication, one of the best indications of organic demand pull, um, just what's happening in the economy. It's absolutely collapsing. So, uh, and, and Scott, maybe you can jump in on this. So, so I've heard that you, you're seeing layoffs in the trucking sector as well. And, and Mike, I think I'm correct on that. I, I saw some yeah. stats on that and it actually coordinates with recessions as well. And Scott, what are your thoughts on like from yesterday, obviously with Jerome Powell, we, we, we're going to get Apple earnings today. I mean, are, are you thinking that, I mean, I got the vibe that he kind of, at least the market took it a little bit more dovish than they were thinking initially. Well, I think he kind of hinted at the fact that the cycle is coming to an end. So but I don't think people care if it's one more hike, two more hikes, or if we're just paused. But I think they're going to be very disappointed if they're waiting for a pivot unless we see something massively break. And as we know, once they pivot is usually when the uh, bear market and, and really kicks in anyways, and that's when things tend to drop. I, I think that we can ignore Pal at this point, to be quite frank. I think that uh, it's we, we obsess over it. It's completely pointless. I don't know if he sneezed in the wrong direction or if one of his eyelashes was pointed left instead of right, and it took it a signal to crash the global economy, but it's completely nonsense that the entire world watches the words of this one man. This, yeah. this is what I was watching when he was speaking. This Fed fund futures in one year. See all the red? That means the market's pricing for lower and lower levels in the future. I mean, it's probably not going to happen with the stock market going down, but this is what was... Tick for tick was dropping yesterday with the meeting is, and there still are, the market's taking out the tightenings out of the future. Wow. 
So, so are we still in, uh, is the market Mike still anticipating a rate cut? What is it? July or August next year? Is that still what it's pricing in? So it's still pricing slightly for a hike into the January meeting. So this is what sh it shows implied rate. This is the futures price implied rate of 5.4%. And the actual effective rate is 5.33. This is the key thing I keep focusing on to take these out. You got to have the Fed, Fed tell us they're not going to, or the stock market goes down. And to me, this is what started to do it. The stock market started to go down. Now it's back up and it's been quite difficult, which is what it's supposed to do, as Jesse Livermore says, markets always do what they should, but uh, just a question of when. But to me, this is the key thing that's happening. The market's price for all this easing, and it's just not going to happen without a good reason, I don't think, because inflation's still sticky. And that's the key thing they did point out in the meeting. Inflation's still sticky, and that's the measures they watch. Personal consumption, expenditures, and employment cost index, core CPI are all just below 4%, and their target's 2%. All right. So flipping, I'll, I'll just quickly throw in here the S&P 500 chart. And what we could see is we've had this massive move basically this week um, ever since. And again, if you look at interest rates, once we hit that 5%, that's kind of where the market was bottoming out. And now we've seen this massive rally on the S&P. And just put this in perspective, last Friday, so tomorrow will be one week ago, we basically touched 4,100 and we're above 4,300 today. Interestingly enough, the rally, obviously, four up days in a row, big up days in a row. But we do have some major economic news, right? We have, well, Apple earnings after the bell today and the non-farm payrolls report tomorrow. Um, Scott, are you thinking that we'll see a weaker number than anticipated? And, and do either of you guys know what's anticipated? What, what's the, what's yeah. the bar set at here? Go ahead, Mike. So I'll pull that up on my screen. I just pull up my ECO screen on the terminal, and it shows non-farm. Um, the key levels for tomorrow, tomorrow is looking for 180,000. That's a consensus okay. change, uh, 145 um, in private payrolls. The interest and the rate at 3.8 percent. So 180 the headline and 3.8 percent. To me, this 3.8 is going to be key because I wanted to show you this. This is one thing that Scott points out a lot. You've met, well mentioned before. This is 3.8 right now. This is unemployment going back to 1940. Have you ever seen it bottom from a level this low and just inch up? No, it jumps up a couple percentage points, always. And also, I just overlay with recessions and, and this indications of recession. This is leading indicator. So this is where we are now. We're going to get a number tomorrow. Our economist, Anna Wong, pointed out oftentimes recessions start a month or two after you get a big blowout number like we had last month, 300,000 or so, and then the pendulum just swings back. But um, this is the key thing I like to point out is it, let's, let's, let's focus on the macro. And that is right now we're at 3.8. There's no room to get except to go up. And it doesn't just inch up every single time it bottoms. It jumps up and you get a recession. Interesting. Interesting. Now, Scott, what do we you think if the let's say the number comes in at 100,000? Are we are we having our fifth rally day in a row or do you think <laughs> there's some profit taking in the S&P? Listen, I think that anything's possible. If you just take a look at the S&P chart, though, you're still under the 50 MA. I am mm. surprised how easily it gapped back above the 200. But like like most of the charts that we're looking at right now, you've got just a series of lower highs. So unless we can get above this level, it's uh, not talking about anything bullish to me, right? You've got high, low, high, low, yep. high, low, just lower, 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 lower. This is a bearish structure. Some will say it's a bull flag, but it needs to break out of it first. And it certainly hasn't done that yet. So for now, I'm calling this exactly what Mike is, which is a bearish trend uh, rally. And if it breaks this high here, you know, around 438, something like that, then I'll start to uh, believing it last week when we were talking actually everything was sitting at support we were showing off showing that everything was yeah. sort of oversold we said listen if it's gonna bounce this is the time to do it it got a much bigger bounce uh than maybe we expected but i know that we've benefited from that at least in the form of tlt because you and i both have been sort of massively long that and beating that drum you know at 83 84 uh even 85 i think before it dipped a little further so i'm enjoying that and you know you can see right here you're looking at the weekly uh on, on tlt it's 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 pretty gratuitous look at that volume this the volume of what, you got sorry i was just gonna say the, the volume yeah. on the bottom of your how heavy that volume was that when was that capitulation was put in. That, yep. that that was capitulatory volume right you go back to the daily uh, you know i love uh overbought bearish divergence uh, oversold excuse me you had massively oversold with a uh, bullish divergence or overbought bearish on the top oversold bullish on the bottom you know to me this looks like uh it's bottoming but but as mike liked to point out right before he said uh, just give it two years, man. <laughs> so, that, right? well, that's a, you, you, you've heard, what's it? What's it? Druckenmuller said he's overweight, long two notes. I think, I, I think it was 
draw Camille said that. And obviously that's a shorter term duration, but I want to piggyback on what you just said, Scott, on, on a two-year chart. So the thing to remember about TLT, its duration is about 16, 17%. That means when interest rates drop 100 basis points, it'll go up 16 or 17%. But with positive convexity, it'll go up more. And this is just a little bond talk. That's why I like to show this chart is we have never had this much of a collapse and TLT or in plunge, uh, spike in rates. And I think when they do revert, you should expect, uh, expect easy 100 to 200 basis points, which means instantly 30 to 40%. And that's why I think this is a big trade that's gonna last quite a long time. And here's what I'll just tilt over to what you were showing here. And you were showing um, S&P 500. I like to show just a, a, a chart of S&P 500. This is what you see in magenta and the Bloomer Combining Index in white. That's a 20 month moving average. They're rolling over, but this is something that hasn't happened in history virtually. Everybody who's traded now, and even my, me, I'm almost six decades, that the Fed, every time it's rolled over, last two times we started rolling over, the Fed started easy. Fed studies, the pivot, they're still not going to, they're still showing tight. And that's why I can say you can try to trade the micro and you guys could do it very well. I like to look at it at some point, the big picture is going to come in. And instead of working for one, two, 5%, it'll be 10, 20, 30% moves that I yeah. think will happen. And, and, and that is when the seriousness starts. So let's let's pivot away from the macro and now talk a little crypto, right? So so Scott, I'm gonna kick this over to you. I got my okay. Bitcoin chart up here. You know, I have this trend line here. We're kind of butting up against that 35, 36 level, but we've seen some of the craziest moves in names like Solana. And I was just commenting that I I was short Solana. I almost got whipped out of it yesterday. Didn't now now where I'm almost back to being flat in the money on it, but just incredible it, it moves in some of these altcoins. And can you explain like what the heck's going on here? Is this just shorts covering? What What's going on? Well, I, I think that uh, today we, we saw that the big daddy still remains in control, right? Bitcoin dropped slightly below support and all of a sudden everything else, if it gets a 1% move, they all get a 5 or 10% move, right? We know that the altcoin market has extremely high volatility versus Bitcoin and is very sensitive to whatever Bitcoin does. So you take a look, I guess, at, you know, that's the weekly, uh, daily, you take a look at the four hour Bitcoin chart. Well, you know, today we topped at 36,000. Dropped all the way down to almost 34 just in a matter of, of hours, right? In a half of a day. So that's going to have a disproportionate effect on that altcoin market. Thing is, I'm still seeing dips in crypto as buys, right? I, I'm not, you're bold trying to short uh, altcoins, which are effectually, effectively leveraged positions on Bitcoin uh, with, with tight stops. And, you know, I, you, you, you manage your risk well. I mean, Solana, listen, I'm actually looking maybe to add at 32, yeah, I'm not looking to short, right? I, I view the stock market right now as I'm looking for rips to short. And I view Bitcoin and crypto as looking for dips to buy. It's a strange place to be, but that's really what the charts are telling me. Solana, though, you know, this was the highs right here from before the FTX collapse, right? About 39 bucks. It's trading above that. It bounced right there. That's looking pretty good. I would just love to see this over, overbought RSI kind of drop down. There's bearish divergences everywhere, by the way, including uh, if you take a look quickly on the daily at Bitcoin. You're probably printing one right now. I'm trying to pull that up, that. but you know you've got you've got higher highs here, lower highs on RSI. So you know I think things need to cool off in crypto for a bit is the uh, consensus there. But I'm looking to buy when they cool off and not get short like you are. It's very 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 aggressive and ballsy if you're if I'm being frank. Yeah, well, and, and, and just and just to be clear, I mean the, the positions are small, right? So it's like it's I'm not crazy enough to go all in on a short, right? It's it's a it's a very manageable position where if it did stop out, it would suck, but it wouldn't necessarily wreck the account. And I think that's that's important to just you know everything in moderation. Literally, right? take literally any position you want in the world, throw darts, uh, slaughter a <laughs> unicorn, and see which way the blood falls. It literally doesn't matter as long as you know your position size, your that's stop right. loss, and how much you're going to lose when you do it. it I don't care. You, literally, you're managing your risk is much more important than your exit your entry your plan your line on a chart it doesn't even matter exactly the discipline of the stop is so important trust and trade number one learning in the trading because we used to joke around when someone was taking too much risk with life or anything we'd say oh he's trading without stops so i mean, to me that's so important but also i want to tilt over to to a little bit to ask you first of all i think what you said scott was very profound the big daddy you can argue that bitcoin bottoming and showing divergent strength is now gaining follow-up from the stock market but i also want to show one thing on my screen one thing that's been significant all year and it's still moving hard and fast and that's gbtc yeah, it's, up the screen. Um, it's 
Yeah, yeah, just on one on a one year basis, you know, on a one year. I mean, on the, on the year alone, it's up over two hundred percent. But a one year compared to you know, Bitcoin seventy three percent, GBT is one hundred thirty two percent. That discount that was around fifty percent is now around thirteen percent. It's gonna at some point go to zero, I think, at question time. But on this yeah. chart, I like to overlay it with. Okay, you can see Bitcoin here. Overlay it with gold. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's up decent, twenty uh, percent. The S and P five hundred is up fifteen percent. I keep pointing out that in the next couple is it just years or so i'm pretty sure gold's going to do well bitcoin might have a little problem if we have that normal risk asset correction but um what's going to happen with the stock market but either way that to me that's the key thing to point out is that that major uh arbitrage that was kicked in last year but how did it become such a good trade it had to get hammered hard first mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so are you guys in terms of into year end? I mean, I, I know uh, you guys are more longer term, or especially Mike, your longer term viewpoint. But like, is gold the best place to be? Is Bitcoin the best place to be? I assume most of us would probably say not stocks. Maybe TLT, Scott. Maybe that's the play into the year end. Do you guys have any preference? I mean, you know, again, I, I, no one's going to hold. At least I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire, no matter what you say. But, I but I mean, what easy. are you guys thinking? Listen, we even had uh, L. Arian come out. By the way, now we have Druckenmiller, Paul Tudor, Jones, L. Arian, and and um, Larry Fink all in the last two weeks making positive statements about Bitcoin. You're talking about the most respected uh, investment yeah. managers on the planet. L. Arian said, I like a barbell strategy of cash and Bitcoin, and I'm not going to fade exactly what he said. So I think short duration treasuries, right? These two-year notes, 30 days, 60, whatever. <laughs> Choose it, roll it over. I don't care. Having that on one side and having an allocation of Bitcoin and gold on the other and not getting cute probably with your investment portfolio that's already you know, uh, automated, I would imagine. Most of you are just investing slowly into stocks you know, uh, first of the month or whatever in your IRA. You should continue doing that because you'll catch the dips if they come. But generally, if I was looking to actually get into anything, it would be TLT, it would be the short duration treasuries. And I still, you know, until I'm proven otherwise, I still think that uh, Bitcoin and crypto have room to run. Yeah, cool. And, and I just want to pop this chart up, guys, is, you know, I see someone asking about GDX. We just touched on on GLD and gold. But take a look at this little inverse head and shoulder pattern developing on GDX. And it's right at this down sloping trend line right here. It's actually a nice little chart pattern. Again, this is something that I would consider looking into year end potentially if it plays out. If gold does have a run, usually gold miners go multiples of gold. So if gold goes up 5%, usually at least the miners go up 10 or even 15%. So interesting little little chart pattern there on GDX. Um, what else do you guys want to look at? Like, like do we, one of the things that, that I would just mention, and I'll throw it over to you, Mike, in just one second, is you know more and more we're hearing about the U.S. debt being problematic. We're seeing these treasury auctions that are really seeing a lack of demand it seems like a little bit of a lack of demand and i think that's kind of added to the worries but uh but tell us mike what's what's going on well i you see that chart there what's happening i think is the u.s government now is borrowing so much it's a giant black hole it's sucking assets from other areas and to me this is a, a it's bad for all risk assets and that's what i see you show you here five percent in the 10 you know five percent across the board in treasuries is just crushing the global market i mean the yen at 150 now it's dropped a third in two years that's declining i mean that's plunging but i also want to show you here i showed you earlier container board um, boxes declined well, let's add to this we'll show you what's really happening in the economy how about natural gas demands plunging mm -hmm. um natural i mean that's the primary measure of heat electricity and first fertilizer how about crude oil um Declining unleaded gas, unleaded gas demand, it's plunging. Now, this I overlay this with um, the uh, average price of unleaded gas in this country, but compared to the peak up right before 2019 and then the peak that bounced in 22, it's rolling over. And this is the Department of Energy estimate. Now, how about one other thing, diesel, the this primary gen, um, bottom line measure for um the economy, the global, certainly U.S. economy, diesel demand is rolling over. Now, if you're at the Fed, that's a good reason to to lay low. And also, one thing I want to point out is um, key thing that might start mattering eventually. If you keep look back at that K K uh, B W bank index, it's unchanged from the end of 1999. That doesn't include dividends, and it used to have. It still has a high correlation with the S and P 500. But S and P 500 is looking a little bit dicey with K with banks declining. And that's one thing that was latest from. Um, that I hear the Fed has a good take on is the latest bank surveys 
um, SLU indices, I think they're called, showing a pretty su substantial um, decline in credit um, allocation. Banks are just not lending like they used to, they're declining credit. So to me, that's a, a recession trajectory, and it's just a question of what it takes to kick it in. Interesting. Yeah, I just speaking of oil and, and energy, just pointing out here, uh, there's a head and shoulders that triggered on oil. And again, I still think it's so fascinating. And I, I always I encourage people to look at the charts more than the news, because interestingly enough, this is where the where the attack on Israel occurred. And we see that even with the fear of Iran getting involved in the Middle East erupting, oil never even came close to the previous pivot high and has since rolled over. So it just puts it in perspective about how, you know, sometimes you hear things on the news and the narratives get crazy about, oh, my goodness, oil is going to go to one hundred and twenty dollars a barrel. Um, I still remember hearing, oh, my goodness, you know, the government has to refill the, the strategic reserve and uh, this is going to be crazy. And really, all oil's done has gone lower from these points of interest. So important to kind of keep it in perspective with this stuff. Um, Scott, what are you looking at? Like, what's what are some of your top things and top factors, uh, top news stories that you think we should be paying attention to? I know you guys do Crypto Town Hall. What's what's the big things people are talking about right now? Well, uh, there's quite a few of them. Obviously, micro my, micro strategy bought some more Bitcoin. That gets everyone excited. For anybody who hasn't been paying attention or playing along, his cost base is around twenty nine thousand six hundred. He's up about uh, twenty percent now on those Bitcoin buys that everybody was giving him crap for for all those years. I think uh, that's a lesson for everybody in dollar cost averaging, moving slowly and having a large, long time frame. Because uh, there was all these narratives he was going to get liquidated at ten. I mean, at 20 didn't happen, 17 didn't happen, 15 didn't happen. He was buying the entire way through, and now his cost basis is well below price. Another narrative I think that's interesting is we've had all these proxy trades for Bitcoin for institutions. Coinbase, I'm showing right here. GBTC, Mike showed another one of them, which is actually up twice as much as Bitcoin. But miners have been lagging. Coinbase has been lagging. A lot of the things that people have been buying to get exposure to Bitcoin have been lagging. And I think that's because there's a lot of capital on the sidelines just waiting for that ETF instead. Why would you buy these at this point if you really think that a spot ETF is coming? Interestingly, BITO, which is the Bitcoin futures ETF, the most successful ETF in all time at the launch, that has actually seen massive inflows, the most since those beginning days. And that's also anticipation of a Bitcoin spot ETF. But all of these things... I believe will suffer massively when the actual ETF comes because people won't need those proxies anymore. And so we've seen a lot of those, including miners, lagging the price of Bitcoin, which we didn't used to see. You used to see Bitcoin miners, Coinbase, MicroStrategy, all these move more than Bitcoin on a move up and down. That hasn't been happening. One factor, like I said, is they're waiting for the ETF. But I think the second factor is the stock market was showing weakness. And people need to remember that if you buy Bitcoin, it's moving because of Bitcoin. If you buy a proxy for Bitcoin on the stock market, you have a proxy for Bitcoin, but also a proxy for the stock market. So if the stock market is going down and Bitcoin is going up, you're going to suffer a bit because you're still correlated to the stock market. And so that's been an interesting narrative, I think. Do you do you think that so? So the big thing is the spot ETF is going to draw in a ton of money. Do you think that is a correct narrative or like do you think like the little granny who hasn't been involved in Bitcoin is all of a sudden going to be like, oh, there's an ETF no. that's not. No. So I'm going to buy. I mean, because that's that's what I'm struggling with is like, OK, if if you're interested in Bitcoin, you probably already have some exposure to it. Now, granted, there probably are pension funds that maybe can do. But even that, I mean, can they even do that? Uh, yeah, well, they would be able to. Anyone could be be able to buy an ETF. So that I think you just hinted at what's actually important. We don't know if the demand will be there, but we know that the access now will. So will if be. that demand ever comes, the ability will be there. And we do know that there have been institutions that have openly said in the past, I would like the exposure to this asset class. I can't get it, right? I have a fiduciary duty. There's no way for me to uh, understand the unknown unknowns of security and custody and all of those things. What I think is important here is that registered investment advisors, A, will be able to offer this to their clients in a way that they weren't be able to before. And B, let's be honest, they'll be able to make money offering it to their clients, which is something they couldn't yeah. do before. An RIA telling someone to go buy Bitcoin on Coinbase to get 2% of your uh, portfolio into it didn't make any money doing that. They're not going to do it. Let's be honest. They're self-interested. Now they'll be able to do it. And so I think whether we see that massive inflow at first or not, I think that they will slowly at least trickle in and we'll start to see some significant AUM. Also, like not to put on my tinfoil hat, but Larry Fink doesn't go live on TV and start calling an asset class a flight to quality while applying for an ETF if he expects it to get a few million in AUM when it launches. That guy's got billions lined up for this thing when it launches. He has to. 
Do you think that these these big institutions have already been accumulating Bitcoin or they're waiting until they get approval? I think very slowly, maybe, but probably waiting to get approval. I, I don't think, you know, even to buy a billion in Bitcoin is like a, not even a day's worth of volume, right? So I, I don't think that they have to massively start to get, put it in. But I do think, you know, when they start listing on the DTCC, which we've seen from uh, both Galaxy and BlackRock, of course, IBTC, Usually they do start at least seeding the uh, the initial fund, but that could literally mean buying five Bitcoin guys. So it's not really much true. to get excited about. True, true. All right. So, Mike, with the jobs data tomorrow, um, is this the beginning of the jobs market deteriorating? Um, that's going to be the beginning of the, the risk. Kind of like we look back and say, remember that jobs number? That was the beginning of the signal that the recession was here per the jobs. Yeah, I think this one's going to start with the stock market. Unfortunately, it's it's typically um, how it, it it's going to work. I think um, it needs to be self fulfilling. So here, what the problem right now is, I only kept this this screen up because we talked about you mentioned crude oil earlier. But I think it's the wealth effect. It's the it's the fact that I heard the average net worth of your typical American increased 37 percent since 2019 before COVID. You know, what? money supply increased since before COVID about 37 percent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just unheard of. So people have this feeling of wealth and it's still holding in the economy. But because of that and this massive fiscal stimulus, we've had, you know, monetary restraint, which I think is going to tilt over and make everything go. I mean, one thing you see is savings is declining, uh, credit card rate delinquencies, faults are increasing. It's the trend is, is very poor, I think. And the the good news is the Fed's paused, but as I showed you in that earlier chart, you basically typically don't bottom till well after knees. And I like to point out in some previous segments is we, after this biggest pump in liquidity in history, it's going to be starting to dump. It's just a question of when, when that triggers. Been early, a lot of other people been wrong, but it's just a question of time. Either way, look at, I showed you that other data, everything's rolling over in terms of things I watched. Yeah, can I quickly throw up my screen just for yes, one second? I just want to show do. something that's pretty interesting because it surprised me. Global M2 money supply, I saw this in a Raul Paul thread actually, mm -hmm. has actually risen. I was under the impression that M2 money supply had been tightening and, and dropping, but that is true down here in the United States, which I actually see it's in the green and rising globally. And you know, today, Japan announced $113 billion in stimulus, which by the way, is uh, they're doing that not because he wants to get reelected, but because he's going to fight inflation by stimulus right i mean that's making more money that, that's yeah it, it, it literally makes no sense it's kind of like we had the inflation reduction act which is actually about printing more money to fund environmental programs in the united states but if you call it the inflation reduction act it's obviously there to fight inflation right i mean like i said to you i think before i mean printing more money or stimulus to to fight inflation is like taking your shoes off to jump into the fire to protect them from getting burned i mean it's literally absurd so that chart, I appreciate you pointing it out. We have a similar metric. I'm just showing the one on my screen for the U.S. That is mostly Japan and China. And what's the problem with Japan and China? They're the biggest importers of crude oil on the planet. And what's happening right now, crude oil is going up because there's a potential war kicking in. This is the U.S. money supply. That number, it looks like a dead cat bounce. It's only going to matter when the U.S. starts pumping the system with mm -hmm. money. And it's and, and, and great, exactly. Until then, it's the, the rest of the world's breaking. Just look at the yen. Look at the yu yuan. I mean, they're plunging and they have to support their own currencies because the U.S. rate at 5.3 or so percent, the base rate is two to three times their rates. <laughs> it's just they can't keep compete. And so that's why I show U.S. money supply minus 3.6 percent. It's never happened. And but we never had this pump of the 26 percent. But overall, since the beginning of of 2020, this thing's up 37 percent. That's never happened either. And that's just starting to go away. And then, you know, the, the I enjoyed reading that in the, the book, The uh, boom, uh, boom and Busts, John Turner and William Quinn. It's you have to expect reciprocity to things like this, particularly if the Fed's still tightening. And maybe they're done tightening, but it's still priced for more tightening. And the market's probably going to take away the rest of it. Awesome, guys. All right. Well, it's uh, 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. Let's wrap it up here. It's been another awesome episode with so much great information. So I appreciate you guys coming on and sharing your insights. Uh, any closing closing points you guys want to make? I think we got it. Go ahead, Scott. I love I, that. I, I, I think we nailed it. The only last thing I would say is that the Fed doesn't really need to tighten when rates are at, at 5%. What did Goldman say? That rates, 10-year yeah, rates good. at 5% cool. is equivalent of four rate hikes? So. Thanks, Gareth. Yeah. Yeah. They, they basically, the market did it for him, right? I think that's, that's, right. The, that's the end exactly. game right there. All right, guys, go follow each and every one of us gentlemen online there. It is awesome to have you guys on here. We will be back next, uh, next Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern time for another episode of Market Mavericks. Have a great one, guys. Thanks again.
Bye, guys.